together today as part of a community of faith who are divided because of a pandemic. More than half of us have concluded that caution prevents them from attending these services, while others of us feel sufficiently safe to be here. We pray for all people of all religions everywhere who face the same ambivalence we do. We seek God's comforting presence for all of us, whatever may be our personal response to the pandemic. Let us therefore, with confidence, worship God. The Old Testament reading is taken from the prophecy of Hosea, chapter 4, verses 11 through 19. In this particular portion of Hosea's prophecy, he is very upset about the tendency of some of the Israelites to continue to go to what are called the high places, the tops of mountains, where the Canaanites had temples, and there they would sacrifice. And they would sacrifice to the Canaanite gods. So Hosea says, Yet let no one contend, and let none accuse, for with you is my contention, O priest. You shall stumble by day, the prophet also shall stumble with you at night, and I will destroy your mother. Wine and new wine take away the understanding. My people inquire of a thing of wood, and their staff gives them oracles. For a spirit of harlotry has led them away, and they have left their God to play the harlot. They sacrifice on the tops of the mountains, and make offerings upon the hills under oak, poplar, and terebinth, because their shade is good. Therefore, your daughters play the harlot, and your brides commit adultery. I will not punish your daughters when they play the harlot, nor your brides when they commit adultery. For the men themselves go aside with harlots, and sacrifice with cult prostitutes. And a people without understanding shall come to ruin. Though you play the harlot, O Israel, let not Judah become guilty. Enter not into Gilgal, and go not up to Beth Aven, and swear not as the Lord lives. Like a stubborn heifer, Israel is stubborn. Can the Lord now feed them like a lamb in a broad pasture? Ephraim is joined to idols. Let him alone. A band of drunkards, they give themselves to harlotry. They love shame more than their glory. A wind has wrapped them in its wings, and they shall be ashamed because of their altars. Amen.
Let us all pray. We give Thee thanks, O God, that the world we have known for nearly all of our lives seem to be such a positive, happy, fulfilling place. Despite frequent bumps in the road, we managed to live through various problems, and individually we moved on. Now, collectively, we are faced with a virus which has seized millions in its apathetic grip and snuffed out the lives of hundreds of thousands of people. We confess to Thee, Lord God, that we feel thrown into a situation such as we have never faced, ill-equipped to know how to proceed. We are unable fully to comprehend what our path should be in the present and how we should become prepared to face an uncertain future. We pray especially for all those who are so thrown by this unparalleled situation that they face each new day with new levels of dismay or despair. By Thy Spirit within all of us, May we be led through this continuing crisis to whatever may lie ahead for us. As always, our prayers go out to Thee on behalf of the poor, the homeless, the dispossessed, and the victims of every kind of discrimination. We especially ask Thy presence to be felt by all such people whose lives are made even more tenuous because of the pandemic. Grant strength and patience to those who minister to such people all around the world. Give greater levels of vision to those in positions of authority who daily must deal with issues that are never overcome but can only be dealt with by continuous efforts to make progress where progress is difficult to be made. Grant us wisdom. Grant us courage for the facing of these days. On this particular Sabbath, we thank Thee for the Jews, that small group of people who alerted the world to the value of a Sabbath day. As we reflect on our own Christian heritage, we realize how much of it ultimately is the result of a Jewish foundation set in place for us by a people who first coalesced 4,000 years ago and whose influence among us is now happily inextinguishable. We praise Thee for Thy light shining through the Jewish people to billions of Christians and Muslims through the past centuries, and for the singular insights they have passed on to us. In their perception of Thy radical oneness so long ago, may we also adhere to that notion, thus giving Thee the praise and worship Thou alone dost deserve. These things we ask in Thy sacred name, and in the name of Christ Jesus, who, along with the Jews, has inexorably drawn us into Thy presence. Now we pray together as Jesus taught His disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The second reading is taken from the book of Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter, verses 1 through 9. The Ten Commandments are found in two books in what we call the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. First in Exodus 20 and then in Deuteronomy 5. This portion of Scripture is what follows immediately after Moses gave the Ten Commandments to the people, and this is his kind of summary of what the Ten Commandments mean. Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the ordinances, which the Lord your God commanded me to teach you, 
that you may do them in the land to which you are going over to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son, by keeping all his statutes and his commandments which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. Hear therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, and that you may multiply greatly, as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words which I command you this day shall be upon your heart. And you'll teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. And you shall bind them as a sign upon your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes and you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates may the Lord bless to us these readings from his holy word and to his name be the glory and the praise Amen the text for today's sermon is the sixth chapter of Deuteronomy, the sixth verse, or the fourth verse, I should say, where Moses says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. The theme for the sermon is monotheism and the Jews. Biblical scholars, like all other scholars, are paid in part to explore thoughts which most of us never think. For example, most of us who have contemplated this at all would say that Abraham was the first person in the history of the world We're on the flight path. I never realized that so clearly as right now. We may have never contemplated this, but some of these scholars say that Abraham was not the first person in the history of the world to become a monotheist. They say that he was the first person in the history of the world to say that he had only one God for himself. Well, everyone else 18 centuries before the time of Jesus believed in many gods. But Abraham was committed solely to one God. The title of that God in Hebrew was El, which means simply God, or more interestingly, Elohim, which means God's plural. God is the totality of all the gods. They also called him Adonai, which means the Lord, but his actual name was Yahweh. But that name was so sacred they would never pronounce it out loud. Personally, I suppose it's okay if Moses or Abraham did believe in only one God for himself, as some of the scholars say. But as far as I'm concerned, he always did believe in only one God for everybody. Be that as it may, the Jews became the first people in the history of the world as a people 
to become monotheists. Monotheism poses the idea that there is just one God. Polytheism, on the other hand, is the belief that there are many gods. Many Christian denominations have adopted what we call creeds. A creed is a short statement of the essence of what ought to be believed. Thus there is an Apostles' Creed and a Nicene Creed and Athanasian Creed and so on and so on. Jews never composed any creeds. The closest thing they have to a creed is our sermon text for today, Deuteronomy 6.4. It is recited in the liturgy of almost every Jewish service of any kind. A regular Shabbat service on the Sabbath, a wedding, a funeral, always that verse is recited. It is called simply the Shema because the first word in the statement in Hebrew is Shema, here. Shema Yisroel Adonai Elohenu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Traditionally, it is said, when a Jewish congregation came to the last word in the Shema, which is Echad, they would shout it. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. They wanted to remind themselves and everyone else, there's only one God, not many. When you think about it, though, polytheism, the belief in many gods, does have a certain amount of sense for people who for centuries were only shepherds or farmers. They were outdoors all the time, as we are semi-outdoors every Sunday morning for the time being. If you're outside, you're seeing the sun, you're seeing the moon, and so there must be a sun god, and there must be a moon god, there must be a rain god, and a wind god, and a god or a goddess who causes fertility. Fertility in animals and fertility in people. The job descriptions of all polytheistic deities are always fairly short. They only do one thing, basically. However, despite the unique concept of monotheism which came about first through the Jews, it would be a mistake to suggest that all Jews from the time of Moses on were monotheists. They were not. Polytheism continued to exercise a strong pull on the religious allegiance of many Israelite shepherds and farmers for centuries after Moses. Our scripture reading from Hosea illustrates that. Hosea lived in the 8th century BCE, five centuries after Moses. In his prophecy, several times he was livid because the Israelites were still worshiping false gods on the tops of mountains. They had temples here and there, everywhere in the nation of Samaria, that part of Israel which pulled away from the Jews centuries earlier. There was only one temple 
said the Orthodox Jews, the proper Jews, and that temple was in Jerusalem, and that is the only place you could make sacrifices. Well, Jews were going to the tops of the mountains in Canaan and worshiping their gods. Not only that, they had women in these temples. It was the sacred responsibility of the women to have sex with the farmers, whether the farmers were Canaanites or Israelites. And why? Because if they didn't, the farmers didn't have sex with the sacred prostitutes, their crops would not grow. This may seem to you to be an unusual religious idea. It's unusual to me as well. It was horrendous to Hosea. In blazing fury he wrote, My people inquire of a thing of wood, an idol, for a spirit of harlotry has led them astray, and they have left their God to play the harlot. They sacrifice on tops of mountains. The men go aside with harlots and sacrifice with cult prostitutes. Like a stubborn heifer, Israel is stubborn. Gods who have short job descriptions may command more allegiance than one God who rules over everything. A monotheistic deity is much harder to comprehend than a god who causes it to rain or a goddess who makes wheat or babies grow. But what a remarkable historical leap of faith it was for an entire people to place their sole trust in a god whom they called Adonai, the Lord. They declared that Adonai was the creator of the world and everything in it. Not only that, but Adonai also created the sun and the moon and the stars, everything in space, except they did not understand space as we do. Incidentally, in the third section of this morning's packet, there is a great story about how space is far, far larger than we ever imagined. Read that story and you will have more devotion to the creator of space. Think of it. Think about it. Every other ethnic group everywhere in the world believed in dozens or hundreds of gods and goddesses. The Egyptians did. The Babylonians did. The Persians and Hittites and Arabs did. Many of the Indians in India still do. But as for at least, as for at least 3,500 years, most of the Jews have worshipped and served one God and Him alone. And that God is Echad, is one. There's a very short eight-word poem. It says, How odd of God to choose the Jews. It does seem odd, doesn't it? Is it raining? Mine. Yes or no? No, but it's May. Okay, it sounds like it to me. Well, I don't hear very well, so maybe it sounded like that all along. If it rains, by all means, come in out of it, uh, those of you who will be in it. Anyway, it is out of God to choose the Jews. There were so many more numerous people back then who would have been better candidates to carry God's message 
If God particularly wanted a people from the Middle East, the Egyptians or Babylonians or Syrians or Persians would have been far more likely candidates. Indeed, how odd of God to choose the Jews. But did God choose the Jews or did the Jews choose God? Who made the first move? The Bible is very clear about that. God chose the Jews, it says. The Jews did not choose God. There are hints here and there throughout the Old Testament that suggest God chose Israel mainly because they seemed the least likely people in the world for Him to choose. The concept of being is encapsulated in God's name. As it explains in Exodus 3, Yahweh means either I am or I am who I am or I will be who I will be. God often seems to prefer the unpredictable. And whoever would have guessed it that the only God who is God would have chosen such an unlikely leader as Moses and such an unlikely people as Israel to become his light to the nations. The so-called sacred tetragrammaton, as the biblical scholars call it, the four-letter name of God, YHWH, is synonymous with the origin of everything. Everything that has existed originated because of the Creator, whose name is Yahweh, the only God who ever existed. As the Muslims say in their creed, such as it is, La ilaha illallah. There is no God, but God. And that introduces a new astonishing feature of monotheism and the Jews. A commitment to the only God characterized to the only one God characterized the Jews from the beginning of their ethnic origins in antiquity. But they had a profound influence on the other two universal Western religions, Christianity and Islam they became monotheistic as well. Jesus was a Jew. He thought of himself as a Jew. He never thought of himself as a Christian. Muhammad was an Arab from the Arabian Peninsula and thus was not a Jew either. But Muhammad was familiar with both the Jewish and the Christian scriptures. He lived among a people who were quite primitive for the time some of whom were polytheists, but most of whom were animists, believing that there were gods in trees and in the ground and in rocks and in the sea, in everything. Very primitive beliefs. Monotheism thus translated from Judaism into Christianity and Islam. And now, over half the world's population are monotheists because of the Jews. Nonetheless, the radical notion of one God alone predated Christianity by at least five centuries. The three greatest Greek philosophers, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, never talked about the Greek gods. Zeus or Athena or Poseidon or whomever. They talked only about God. Theos. Singular. Theos means God. The longer time went on, at least as time was reckoned west of the Indus River, polytheism slowly lost its grip on people. Perhaps a primary reason for that was urbanization. More and more people began to move into cities. Damascus, Byzantium, Jerusalem, 
Alexandria, Athens, Rome. Jericho is said by the Jews to be the oldest city in the world because it's in Israel. The Syrians say that the oldest city in the world is Damascus because it's in Syria. In one sense, for the past thousand years, the history of humanity has been the march of rural people into cities, large and small, all over the world. When you no longer make your living off the land, the multiplicity of divinities somehow loses its appeal. If people tended to become united in cities, it gradually seemed to become clear to them that the idea of gods, plural, also needed to become united in one God, singular. That was the urban way. The more educated people became, the more they naturally coalesced in monotheism. However, that was not true for all educated people. Many of those who devoted their lives to such academic disciplines as philosophy, medicine, mathematics, or physics concluded there's no God at all. They either became atheists, a theos, without God, or they became agnostics, a gnosos, without knowledge of God. Still, over the last two millennia, the great majority of people in the Western world became monotheists. And it is all because of the Jews. So it was that God, speaking through Moses in the Sinai Desert 3,200 years ago, said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And you shall bind these words as a sign upon your hand. And they shall be as frontlets before your eyes. And you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and upon your gates. I'll never forget the first time I went to Israel. We were flying on an El Al flight because there was a group of seven Christian clergy from northern New Jersey who were put together as a group by a rabbi. One of my great heroes in faith, Rabbi Morrison Beale of Summit, New Jersey. Our guide in Israel, Walter Zanger, had been bar mitzvahed by Morrison when Walter was a boy and Morrison was the rabbi of, their, of the Zanger family synagogue in Brooklyn. Walter called us, the seven clergy, the seven samurai of summit. You know how when you're flying east, out of any place from the East Coast, you generally leave in the early or late evening. The sun comes up earlier when you're over the ocean than it would have if you had stayed in New York or Atlanta. Because when it comes up, it is 1 or 2 a.m. New York or Atlanta time, but it is 5 or 6 a.m. over Ireland or maybe France or Spain. In any event, on that flight, when the sun came up, all the Orthodox Jews on the El Al airplane, and there were a number of them, got up out of their seats, stood in the aisle, and they had a funny little leather box right here between their eyes held on their head by leather straps which they would tie behind their head. That little leather box is called a frontlet. 
In the box was a small script in Hebrew of Exeter of Deuteronomy 6, 1 through 9. The central verse of which is Shema Yisrael Adonai Elokeinu Adonai Echad Hear O Israel, the Lord our God is one. These men then would wrap leather straps around their arms and around their hands, both arms, both hands, and they would go like this, reciting scripture and praying, headed toward Jerusalem, which is where we were going, almost. El Al doesn't fly into Jerusalem. Each of these men, and they were all men, were doing this, bobbing toward Jerusalem, praying with this little leather box here and these strange wrappings around their arms called phylacteries. I, a goy, a Gentile, had grown up in Madison, Wisconsin, knowing many Jews but none of them was orthodox, so I had never seen this. I was absolutely thunderstruck and fascinated by this ritual. Well, as I say, inside each of those little frontlets is the script with Deuteronomy 6, 1 through 9. Have you ever gone to a Jewish house and you notice on the right side there's a little metal piece with Hebrew inscriptions etched into the metal. Inside that little piece, which is about that wide and about this long, is the same verses in script in Hebrew. And the main thing to remember when you see that or you see this or you see these, is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The little thing is called, incidentally, a mezuzah. You've seen them, I presume, you just didn't know what it was. A plethora of God's is a problem, a very large theological problem. Over the long haul, polytheism will not work for most people. But monotheism, monotheism, now there is a concept to which we can devote our entire being for our entire lives. He is one Christian people. He is one. Shema Yisroel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Amin and Amin. Now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you and dwell in your heart forever. Amen. Thank you.